Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Lavoy. I'm one of the uh, senior class representatives for HLB. And I'd like to introduce today Ruth Kaplan, assistant professor of English, who'd like to talk about rethinking Renaissance pedagogy. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here um, and delighted to see so many wonderful and familiar faces. Can you all hear me OK? Great. Um, so my title is Rethinking Renaissance Pedagogy. And the reason that that is my title is that my work is really about um, both rethinking the pedagogy of the Renaissance, how uh, educators, professors specifically taught in the Renaissance in England, and also rethinking our own pedagogy as professors, um, and specifically mine as a professor of the Renaissance, whose values have been really inflected by those of those Renaissance professors of old. Um, my research started when I noticed the really crazily exaggerated rhetoric of humanist professors um, in the Renaissance in England. Humanism was a new educational movement that argued that the most important thing you could possibly teach to young people was classical literature, Latin literature. And the goal seemed to be to create young men, specifically, who would be able spontaneously to give a Ciceronian oration, right? In any situation, you should be able to give a Ciceronian oration of your own devising. Um, so for example, one method that they did to inculcate this ability in students was to have them translate from Cicero into English and then back into Latin. And then the professor would mark um, all the ways that their Latin was different from Cicero's Latin and tell them how much better Cicero's version was. <laughs> that was how you learned Latin. Um, and they made these just wildly hyperbolic claims about what the study of rhetoric, including the study of Latin poetry, could do for you. So Thomas Wilson, who was um, an educator of the time and a statesman, wrote that there was a man named Pyrrhus, a great king, who was trying to conquer cities. And he had an orator who he would send in front of the, his armies. And the orator would try to convince the towns to give themselves up without battle. Um, so Wilson uses this anecdote basically to argue that rhetoric is more important than war, right? It's more important than armaments. It's more important than soldiers. It is what allows you to conquer the minds of other people. Um, another educator called the study of rhetoric um, something that allowed you to become the emperor of men's minds, right? So you can see the, the emphasis on persuasion, which I'm sure you're all familiar with in terms of rhetoric. Um, Philip Sidney, a poet of my period, wrote that poetry, which again was really tied with rhetoric. Oh, is it over? Oh, no, no. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> poetry um, is the monarch. Poetry is the king of all pursuits of knowledge um, because, quote, not only does the poet show the way, this is to a moral life, but he gives so sweet a view as it will entice any man into enter it. So poets and orators are the seducers of humans, right? We persuade, we seduce them into right living. Um, unfortunately, almost all the people I study completely failed to persuade anybody of anything. So Thomas Wilson. <laughs> Uh, made a really long oration in Parliament about taxes. His argument was voted down. He wound up using, a, a, very sadly, a form of persuasion known colloquially as torture for Queen Elizabeth. Um, not a lot of rhetoric used there, or at least verbal rhetoric. Um, Sidney failed ever to have a major political role, although he yearned for one. Um, and Spencer, who's one of the poets I focus on a lot, as Professor Bob Smart will never let me forget, um, his interest in poetry and rhetoric came down to recommending that the Irish nation be subdued by means of famine. So again, not a lot of verbal facility doing the war there. <laughs> um, so much for rhetoric. So I study poets who were trained at a time when this was the ideology about the education they were receiving. And the poets that I study are really skeptical about that ideology, which is what interests me. Um, in my classes, I try to learn from the failures of humanism, like my poets who reject the power of the orator in favor of thinking more about the power of the reader to interpret any text or any oration as they choose. Um, I try to 
reject in situations other than this one. I tried to reject the top-down authority of a lecturer in favor of the multiple perspectives of my students. Thank you.